Cynthia, um, I think it went all right this time. While you were talking, I got the last presentation sent in to me. Joni is uh, working on the Isabella Oriole project in Kabagan um, and Bagao in Cagayan Valley. And she's been sitting in the internet cafe since 9 a.m. this morning trying to send me this video. So I'm going to download it right now. Maybe someone can uh, do a dance or something while I'm uh, rushing to get it. Or Jobs, did you manage to get it and you can present it? Yeah, I, I think... Let, let me try that. All right. So I think Joni is not able to connect to us to be online with her. And I think the backup for the Oris project to answer questions fell asleep on the other side of the world because her project partner, Nikki Diane Rialobit, is currently in the U.S. studying. Good day, uh, everyone. My name is Joni Akai, and I will be... <laughs> All right. Go ahead, Jobs. Everyone, my name is Joni Akai, and I will be talking to you about this bird, the Isabella Oriole. The Isabella Oriole is found only in Luzon, and in the early 90s was thought to go extinct after it hasn't been seen for 30 years. There were reports here and there, but there was no substantial documentation, not until 2003, but more on that later. Since its rediscovery, there was only a handful of information as basis for its conservation. And it was only in the last 10 years that there is more targeted approach to look for the bird, assess its habitat, document threats to the species among others, which has now allowed us to identify key activities that we think are crucial for the survival of the species. Of course, this can change as we know more about the bird. And so in this presentation, I will talk a bit more of the oriole and its habitat and what has been done so far for its conservation especially as a flagship species for lowland forest ecosystem. The conservation activities that we do at Buai Ilang is part of a bigger project we call the Oris Project. The name is just a combination of the first two letters of the scientific name of the Isabella Oriole, Oriolus Isabelae, O-R-I-S. The Oris Project has been going on for about eight years now and is a collaboration among different agencies. And before I get into the meat of the presentation, I'd like to briefly acknowledge our partners in this endeavor. While a new home has welcomed me and the Oris project in Buhay Ilang, much of the work on, Is on the Isabella Oriole was done when I was with Mabuaya Foundation, a local NGO based in Isabella province. They are also doing exceptional work in conserving other flagship species in the region, such as the Philippine crocodile, flying foxes, and sea turtles. Through the years, we have worked with the local government units, the DNR, and the local university there, the Isabella State University. The project has also been supported by several volunteers and donors. The Wild Bird Club of the Philippines has been a major driver in raising awareness and generating interest among bird watchers and the general public about the project. And members sometimes even travel all the way up north from Metro Manila to volunteer. The CLP or Conservation Leadership Program gave us our first break back in 2012. And since then, we've received financial support from other agencies as well and currently from the Oriental Bird Club through the March Conservation Fund of Tides Foundation. We've also been receiving continuous support from several individuals and also bird watchers, donating binoculars and field equipment, and also linking us to potential partners. So on to the presentation, uh, the star of the, the, the Oris project, the Isabella Oriole. So it's classified with the most severe risk of extinction, critically endangered with a population size estimated to be fewer than 250 mature individuals left in, in the wild. And then that, that's estimated to be around 70 to 400 individuals. Uh, we think that there, the population is still continue, continuing to decline uh, because of the main threat, which is the loss of its lowland forest habitat. As I mentioned, it is endemic to Luzon, and it's found in two distinct locations that is Maribelas Mountains in Bataan, and the Sierra Madre Mountain Range in Isabela and Cagayat. Here is a brief account of its historical distribution. It was first discovered in Isabela province in 1894, hence the name, and then described by Ogilvy Grant. Then later in the early 1900s, it was also seen in Bataan. In 1960, it was also discovered in Cagayan, and around that time, it was still described as quite common. But then several surveys in the 90s did not find the species. There were incidental reports in 1993 and 1994, but were dismissed as uncertain. 
because of the lack of clear evidence until 2003, 40 years since it was seen last. A pair of Isabella Orioles were found in San Mariano in Isabella province. And their results of the observation were uh, published in a 2004 article. Not only were the photos taken of the bird, but also recordings of the calls, which was a breakthrough in the research. And here is one of its calls. This is described as a mournful, slightly descending call, much like a whistle. And another call, slightly higher and rising. And if you listen closely, you hear the click, click call. That is also another call, one of its calls. It's uh, similar to a, an insect or a cricket call or sound. So these first recorded calls were very instrumental in our initial findings to be able to document this very elusive bird. And here you see me back in 2012 with my team in our very first exploratory survey. With me here is the best partner in crime you could ask for, Nikki Diane Ray Lebit, uh, doing the surveys with me. So we were uh, raising the speakers up to lure the birds out for us to be able to document it properly. We were such fledglings back then, and so it was important to be able to see the oriole because we could have easily mistaken it for another similar species of oriole. In Luzon, we actually have three other three species of orioles. And the white lord oriole shares the same habitat with the Isabella oriole, and it sounds like this. Quite similar, but you can easily distinguish the white lord oriole by the pinkish beak and, of course, the white lords. With the recordings, we did eventually find the Isabella oriole, but none in Bataan. Our observations led us to North Luzon. And the current observations were restricted to the western side of the Sierra Madre mountain range. The blue polygons you see here are the national protected areas. And the green one is a boundary of a town called Bagao, where most of our observations were from. Uh, we know as of now that there may be 30 or 40 individuals around the small area that we have been doing surveys so far. That's about one in five, one individual in 500 hectares. Uh, unfortunately, Bagao has no legal protection status. But then again, a protected area does not always mean that it is efficiently protected. So succeeding efforts were then focused in Bagao. In 2016, we helped the barangay and the local community in Santa Margarita to declare 5,500 hectares of their forest as a wildlife sanctuary to continue protecting the Isabella oriole and other wildlife, and as well as the rest of the remaining forests in the area. Here is a spectrum of the habitat of the Isabella oriole in that site. Uh, you see here a fragmented residual forest on the left, which is a mosaic of um, a secondary forest surrounded by agricultural lands, and on the right side are old growth forests. Um, and in this old growth forest, there is a small community of mainly indigenous peoples, small school, and a few farms. Interestingly, the Isabella oriole appears to prefer the forest edge or the mosaic of the fragmented secondary residual forest with their agricultural lands. And it seems to tolerate some degree of disturbance despite those agricultural lands. And interestingly, there's also less encounters in the old growth forest where the white lord oriole can be found. This begs to question, is there resource competition between the two species or is the detection probably, probability just lower? And that's why we couldn't uh, detect the Isabella oriole in the old growth forest. And also, maybe the Isabella oriole is actually a forest edge specialist. These are questions we that we still don't have answers to, but nonetheless, we know a few things that could help the management of this sanctuary and other oriole habitats. 
In a study in 2016, together with a student intern of Mabuaya, we looked at the movement of the Orioles in their habitat. In this two kilometer stretch of transect, we found five groups of Orioles, mainly in pairs, and it appears like they do have their own territories, one hectare, two hectares at least. But more than that, we tried to lure them out with playback calls across these open areas. And instead of flying straight through, they actually uh, followed the tree line. This shows how important forest corridors are in their movement, probably to be able to access food and other resources in nearby forest patches without being detected. So if this community is actually able to uh, protect their forest patches, the forest corridors in this area, it's not difficult to believe that the Oriole can actually live in harmony with the people here. That is, if agriculture is made more efficient and more sustainable. While we don't have any records of nests yet, we more or less know when the breeding season of the Isabella Oriole is, and that's around summer season. Uh, we have observed a fledgling in May, which indicates that maybe the breeding season is somewhere around April. We also know that it feeds on insects and small fruits, such as those of the fig and macaranga. We, all, we see them either solitary or in pairs, but also sometimes in mixed flock with other species as well, like the bar-bellied cuckoo shrike, the black and white triller, and the white lord oriole. Which brings me to the importance of conserving the Isabella oriole as a flagship species. Because this bird shares the habitat with all the different other wildlife, from big birds like the Philippine eagle, hawk eagle, rufous hornbill, to ground-dwelling birds, your bleeding heart, the ground warbler, to small understory birds like the babblers, canopy birds like your racket tail, but also other beautiful plants and animals like the jade vine and this cloud rat, along with this other wonderful species. So where there is this rich, very rich biodiversity, not only will the Oriole benefit from protecting the area, but also the local communities will benefit from the ecosystem services that it will provide. And so which brings me to the next part of the presentation, how important our research results are to be translated into management-related outputs, such as protecting it as a local conservation area, as a critical habitat, and even recommending uh, management for sustainable ecotourism sites, for example. And here is a photo of us in June 2016 when we were discussing on how to protect the uh, Santa Margarita Wildlife Sanctuary with the local communities. Aside from these conservation outputs, it is important to build or build awareness and appreciation of nature among the communities there. So that's why we have our education initiatives. We gather the community, we have lectures in schools and trainings for law enforcement, for example. We print materials in tarpaulins, in posters, and distribute them around. And education should just not be in, an, in a classroom setting, but it can also be in a fun way, like festivals or puppet shows, and even printing um, beautiful calendars. Also in promoting sustainable ecotourism, we also have to make sure that the guides are well trained, especially in ethical bird watching and the proper identification of wildlife. These members of the local communities are the, are the ones sharing the forest with the Oriole. And amidst this long-term lockdown due to the COVID crisis, I know I can count on them to look after these birds. And affecting change in even just one of them is a step towards the survival of this species. And thank you. So that ends my presentation. Thank you for listening. Uh, for more information, you can visit our website at buhayilang.com or email us at info at buhayilang.com. Have a great day. All right. Thank you so much, Joni. Let's have a big digital applause for all our presenters.